trying to highlight that Dante's Divine Comedy is a spiritual classic. Yes, it's a classic of literature, and I and I want people to read it for pleasure, uh, read it for aesthetic insight. Uh, that's all wonderful and good, and I want uh, my own students who are examining this text to find it enjoyable, find it fascinating, um, to find its poetic approaches to be uh, disruptive of our usual kind of patterns of thought as great poetry um, can do. But I want us to see it as a spiritual classic, especially attended for the second half of life task that means going down in order to go up. That's kind of what I want to um, invite us to, is to kind of see this as not just something someone reads in order to be a cultured person, right? But something that we would read as a guide, as something to help us in midway through our journey of life um, to find guidance um, in our own uh, journeys of learning. So the few little comments I want to make, I have three main comments. The first has to do with the threefold structure of the whole divine comedy. So it's broke down in these three sections, the Inferno, um, the Purgatorio, and Paradiso, right? And the first will be the going down into the depths of hell, you know, deep, deep, deeper, circling down, and then passing through the earth and coming out on the other side. Notice this is the Middle Ages and they didn't think the world was flat. They thought it was round. Anyway, uh, going through the sphere, coming out the other side, going then up the mountain of purgatory is the second book, right? Go, which goes through the, the, the seven uh, great vices. Um, but there it's a journey of hope, not of the despair that the others are experiencing in hell, but those who know, yeah, we have some growth to go, but we know that we are assured of our joy. And then as he gets to the top of the mountain, then he shoots off, has to leave Virgil behind because Virgil isn't allowed to go up into the paradise. And there he flies through the skies, passed through the planets and stars all the way up in with Beatrice as his guide. Um, into uh, the very light and presence of God. Right? That's his journey and gets to visit saints along the way. Right? So you get this kind of threefold structure. And this has a, not a precise, but a loose um, correlation with the classic threefold structure of the spiritual life as is found in both East and West. I'll use the language of Evagoras and the Desert Fathers who speak of the, the three basic stages of the uh, um, spiritual life as um, uh, practicae, uh, theoretica and gnostica. Practica is um, practice, right? The practice of um, overcoming one's vices and sins, right? That life of repentance, right? That's grounded in faith in Christ's righteousness for us and setting aside the, uh, the unrighteousness of our own um, bad habits and bad patterns, right? And then that second stage, theoretica, is um, then the illumination. This is called the illuminative way in the in the in the in the West in Latin. Um, the receiving of insight, the receiving of wisdom, uh, still practical wisdom for the transformation of one's life, but coming in to an, a, a, a discernment of how to live um, righteously and uprightly um, before God and growth in virtue, right? So there's that setting aside of vice and then the putting on of this new life, right? And bringing in the new insight and resting in the truth of God's grace for us. And then the highest of these, which almost cannot be spoken of, nostike, which is to know this intimate knowing and union with God. In the West, this is purgative, illuminative, and unitive. And in the East, practice, theoretica, and nostike. Um, so this is this journey into perfection, this journey into absolute union with God. And there's, again, not exact, but a loose correlation you can see with these three parts of the divine comedy, right? The the journey down into hell is this journey down where he comes, Dante the pilgrim comes to a self-awareness of himself and of his own sinfulness, right? It's an awakening, right? Um, and then as he turns around and starts to make his way up, the themes all start to center around light, right? And this truth that comes to him. And he starts to learn all about how his vices are being um, 
uh, will be uh, stripped and his virtues can emerge, right? So there's this journey upward, right? And then finally shooting off like a rocket into heaven, moving towards union with God, right? So it's not an exact correlation because in many ways you can kind of think of the transitions as the transition. In some ways, the first book is really just getting that journey of practice of, of purgation started, right? Getting that going by awakening us to our own sinfulness. Whereas this, the mountain of purgatory then is actually living out that practical life, uh, reducing, uh, you know, uh, 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 overcoming vice, entering into virtue, right? Moving towards an illumination that comes at the top of the Mount of Purgatory. And then the whole movement, in many ways, the last, you know, terset or last at most uh, chapter of the Divine Comedy is the, the Gnostike, the union with God, which he himself isn't even experiencing. He's kind of just getting a tour of what it could possibly be. It's very... Um, as the kind of uh, indirect uh, signaling that good poetry always has. But you can kind of see this journey, right? And the biggest lesson I want us to learn for those of us, who, those of you who are um, listening to this for the Doctorate of Ministry in Spiritual Formation, we have this three-year journey, and Dante is going to be one, not our only, but one of our guides through this three-year journey of coursework and the project after that. And we're, I've assigned the Inferno this year with a view to then assigning Purgatorio next year and the uh, Paradiso in the third year. Now you're free to read ahead, um, but I didn't want to overwhelm you with the whole Divine Comedy this uh, spring semester, so we're spreading it out um, with an eye to even thinking of this journey for us, this initial journey of self-awareness to what the great need we have for God's transforming grace. And then we'll move forward into what it means to live into that and how, and then begin to explore where things might be headed even beyond our um, hopes and imaginations. So that's kind of that three-stage process. So uh, I said I had three points. So that's the first big one. The short one is this middle one, which is just to reiterate um, why how Dante fits in as a self-awareness text. For me, Dante became a spiritual classic <laughs> and ceased to just be a literary classic. Again, those are not mutually exclusive, but I'm talking about emphasis here. Um, when I stopped seeing it as this kind of text out there, this classic of our history that might be interesting or fascinating, or I might argue with his views, that kind of thing. When I let go a little of that purely objective reading, treating the text as an object over against me, with me as the subject, the agent acting on it, and started to have it be a tool to help me in my own self-awareness, right? When I started reading with myself as being read by the text, as it were, to let my own self become an object of knowledge and let this text become an aid to my own subjectivity in that self-awareness. Again, if the subject-object thing's throwing you off, uh, don't, don't stress out about it, but that it's by reading and seeing the sufferings of these people, which again, it's all imaginative. He referred to it as a beautiful lie. It's, it's all a way of coming into an awareness of my um, own and our as humanity and human communities, um, proclivities, weaknesses, failings, sinfulness, right? To come to an awareness of those, not in order to um, punish myself um, or even to have an excess of pity. You'll notice Virgil keeps nudging Dante along. Don't get stuck there staring. Just notice, learn, see, begin to perceive what you do not yet perceive in yourself um, and in the world around you flowing out of that self-perception. So it's this self-awareness journey that I think Dante is actually uh, brilliant at bringing out precisely through his poetic style, precisely through the foreignness of this cultural world that he inhabits. Um, so I, I hope that you'll find that this can be a more uh, uh, spiritually enriching reading than it maybe was when you read, banged it out in college in order to pass a test, right? But actually something that you can spend time with and let it help you begin to read yourself. So that's that self-awareness um, connection. Last thing I wanted to mention was, um, I, I first started assigning this book after it first shaped me in a, in a training that I went through. Um, I first started assigning this book in my Aquinas course, and some people who watch this might be in my Aquinas course. Um, 
or, or have been or going to be. Um, and I, I started assigning it there because I was looking around for a textbook um, to introduce people to the broader medieval world because it was a course on medieval theology. I wanted to focus on Aquinas, but wanted to get some exposure to the broader medieval world. And all the textbooks I was reading just, I don't know, I hate to say it, but they were a little dry and I was a little bit worried, not just for the pleasure of my students, but the actual insight because, you know, just a dry textbook, um, if it doesn't draw us in, won't always guide us in the way that great literature can. And it occurred to me that actually, you know, maybe the best tour of the medieval world is a medieval writer's tour of the underworld and, and beyond um, into the... Uh, um, Purgatory and Paradiso. So his tour of this world, but as this great medieval writer and thinker, you end up bumping into all the key themes and issues and topics and hot topics of the day in the medieval world. So I actually found it to be a really great way of entering in. And, and for those in the DMIN program, um, we're reading uh, predominantly Catholic, Roman Catholic authors, some Eastern Orthodox as well, lots of medieval materials. Um, and so it's very helpful to kind of have a somewhat poetic and narratival and hopefully a little bit playful and pleasurable even way into that whole world that takes time getting used to. Here's a great contrast I learned from my teachers, George Hunsinger, that the, the, there's kind of these two great pieces of literature that capture the uh, Roman Catholic and the uh, Protestant Reformation a ways of approaching spirituality. So notice this comparison. It's the it's divine comedy on the one hand, as this kind of Roman cat this Roman Catholic uh, um, spirituality, and Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress as this kind of classic embodiment of uh, Reformed Protestant uh, spirituality. I mean, no, notice the difference. The 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 story of 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 Dante. The Divine Comedy is uh, higher and higher, more and more, growth, right? Growth in grace, right? Growing away from vice into virtue, getting closer and closer and closer, right? It's this movement. It's very hierarchical, as it were, right? Um, higher and higher, more and more. Whereas Bunyan's story is a story of again and again, again and again. You, you'll you'll keep encountering levels where certain sins are worse than others and certain uh, uh uh, vices are, you know, uh, less worrisome than others, and certain virtues are more important than others, and then the higher and greater uh, graces and virtues that you'll see as you move, you know, it's always moving up, right? This, the, there's this leveling, this hierarchy, whereas this is this total uh, evenness and flatness in Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, you know, Pilgrim doesn't really even grow. The, you know, Christian doesn't even really grow <laughs> much in the whole story, right? I mean, when he's swimming across the water at the end, right, he almost drowns and has to get help um, across the water, right? It, it's a story of perseverance, right? It, it's almost as if the, the Dante presents this Catholic spirituality of space, of um, a hierarchy of a cathedral, as it were, of higher and relations, these organic connections in a grand hierarchy. And this Protestant picture that you get in Bunyan of perseverance of the saints over time, right? It's extended over time, but really all that passes is time. It's not like Christian is like particularly a better Christian at the end than he is earlier. Once he's converted, he's in, and it's a matter of being faithful throughout time in his life, right? So he's still struggling all the way to the end, but still makes it hooray, right? And you, you even get the same thing where he's in the, 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 the prison towards the end, and he doesn't know what to do. And it's not like he's learned how to get out of prisons. He just remembers, ah, I have the key right here, right? And it's like the grace is always there. All you have to do is have that faith and keep coming back to it. I think both of these are beautiful pictures because they're both true. It's both true that we grow more and more in grace, but it's also true that we just come again and again back to the same grace we started with. I think they're both true, and I think it's helpful to learn both of these lessons. Um, but since most of the writers we uh, uh, are going to be encountering in the historical theology of spiritual formation courses, um, if you're in the DMIN, but for anyone who's listening along to this, a lot of the great spiritual literature is in that framework of more and more. You know, Protestant literature too that is leans in that way. Wesley's a little bit more in that frame, although he's still has that Bunyan side to him too, right? So lots of people in this tradition that we're going to be reading, and you have to have that framework in mind. And Dante's a great way to kind of imagine one ways, in, imagine one's way into that world. 
right? By way of this much more inclusive story that draws on all these different traditions versus the more biblicist approach that you find in Protestant spirituality. What's the Bible, what's the Bible verses attached to that idea?